Let's get started. And see everyone. Great. Uh, I'd like to call the March 14th, 2022 Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting to order. Can we please have the roll call. Erin Angel. Here. Scott Conlin is currently not present. Jeff Ellen Bogan. Hello. Manoj Yangwar. Present here. Paige Lewis. Here. Nicholas Novello. Here. Dan Olson. Here. And Council Liaison, Tim Waters. Here. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll now go to approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Jeff? Yeah, could we do new business, all, all three items before we do old business? Anyone have any concerns with that? Okay, are there any other amendments to the agenda? No. Okay, uh, with that, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I move to yeah. approve the agenda as amended. Great. Thanks, Erin. You need a second. Yes. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Great. Thank you. Okay. Next, we'll move to approval of the previous month's minutes. And I did have a couple of edits. Does anyone else have any? Edit. Okay, I will tell you mine quickly. Okay, on the first page of the minutes under old business, um, discuss 2022 Prav agenda calendar. Uh, it says Paige noted she had prioritized the new facility. And I just wanted to say I'd prioritize um, talking about a new recreation facility. noted that having a report card of interim things from parks will help. Um, I believe Kathy talked about the idea of doing a report card that was an update on what had been accomplished from the previous master plan. Does anyone remember? Because I think she put it out there as an idea of something that we might talk about. That sounds right, Paige. I don't actually remember the full context of that's probably something that's much more doable and makes more sense as far as the way we've been tracking projects. So I think it was a, a report card of progress on items in the previous master plan. Okay. And then uh, the last one is where it a little bit further down, Steve Ransweiler requested the board make dates and suggestions for the tour. Um, I just would say suggestions for the upcoming Prad field trip or tour, just so there's context in the notes. And that's it. There's no other edits. I need a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Dan? I move we approve the minutes from last month as, as amended. Great, need a second. Yes, great, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, the minutes are approved as amended. Okay, now we are at public invited to be heard. 
I was told earlier that no one had reached out. Have we heard from anyone since? No, we have not. Okay. Then we will move along to new business per just request. Great. And do you want to? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Um, hey, John, I was just going to say, I'll go ahead and do a quick introduction here for people um, on this first topic. I believe is zero waste. Is am I correct? Um, it is. Yes. The zero, zero waste, waste resolution. Myself scroll up here. So our, our presenters tonight are going to be Lisa Knobloch, who is our program manager uh, for sustainability. Charles Kemenides, who is our uh, manager of solid waste program for the city and Francie Jaffe, who is a split position at this point between water conservation and sustainability. And of the three Great, of them thank want- Thank you. Who wants to start? <laughs> I'll go ahead. Uh, great. Um, thank you for that introduction, David. Um, chair and members of the board, thank you for having us tonight. I. Charlie was unable to join us this evening, um, but I'll be presenting and then Lisa and I will be here to uh, answer questions. Um, does, should I bring up my presentation or was um, the, the Veronica going to bring that up? I can also, I don't think I have ability to share my screen at this time. Um, Fancy, I can make. I can make it so you can show, um, share it. So give me just a second. Oh yeah, great. Thank I don't you. have your so, yeah your presentation. Hold on. Okay. Uh, while Veronica's giving me that ability, um, we are presenting today on the zero waste resolution update and universal recycling ordinance. These are two items uh, that are being developed this year and hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give a quick background on uh, the history and why we are updating and developing the, um, these items. And then we have a discussion question that we are going to focus on uh, during our time today and that we'd really like to hear some feedback from the board to help guide us in our work. And then after the discussion, I'll have just a quick two slides on the timeline for implementation and how other ways that you can get involved. So the trash has an impact on our community in different ways from litter to pollution, as well as impacting our greenhouse gas emissions. And we have a long history of trying to reduce trash in our community. Um, from starting recycling in 1990 uh, to passing our first zero waste resolution in 2008 and updating our residential uh, curbside systems to be uh, pay as you throw and adding curbside composting. Um, so what we're focusing on this year is up developing an update to that zero res waste resolution and drafting a universal recycling ordinance. So the main difference between the resolution and the ordinance is that the resolution will be setting our commitments and policy and direction for the city. We will be bringing uh, uh, updated targets that I'll share on a, a future slide that will really help guide staff work going forward. And then the ordinance will really set this work into law. Uh, we're focusing on an ordinance, a, a zero, a universal recycling ordinance can have different focuses. Uh, it could, in the name says recycling, so often the focus is on recycling, but there are ordinances that look at composting, especially in restaurants, which um, have a lot of food waste. It can apply to different sectors. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, large multifamily, commercial. Uh, those would be new additions we already look to uh, provide recycling for all our residents. And it can be done in a phased approach. So we're hoping to present this ordinance to council by the end of the year. Um, but that doesn't mean that January, if, it, if passed January 1st next year, it'll start being implemented. The first year could be continued education. Um, and then it could start maybe with a focus on recycling to begin with and have a phased uh, approach over time. 
so the guiding principles that are guiding us this work is that uh, we want everyone to live in a clean and safe community, that we work to increase access to recycling and composting for all, and that reducing waste supports our climate action goals. Currently, uh, we have a residential waste diversion target that was established in the sustainability plan uh, of 50% uh, by 2025. Uh, last year, we were at 42% of our residential waste being diverted from the landfill. So we are on track to meet that goal. And in terms of composting, it's currently an opt-in service. Um, so we have about 24% participation in that. And I know our waste services staff are looking into other options and in looking at different program possibilities of how we could increase that participation in the future. So I mentioned earlier that we are looking at more aggressive uh, targets. Right now we just have the residential target. Uh, in late 2020, we did a greenhouse gas life cycle analysis. And in that analysis, we uh, looked at these two more ambitious targets. So both are at the same goal at 2025 but aiming for 50% all sector waste diversion at that time. The first scenario aims for 85% all sector. And I, I bolded that all because our current goal is just residential, why all would be any waste being generated in long lot, not just residential. The second scenario is more ambitious, bringing that 85% goal to 2035 for the residential and commercial sectors. Um, but 60% for construction demolition. Um, that is construction and demolition doesn't have as much infrastructure. Uh, I know there are efforts to increase that work, um, but it's probably the hardest sector to increase recycling at this time, um, but still working by 2050 to have 95% of all sector waste division. So these are the current proposed targets that we are looking at and considering including in the zero waste resolution update for city council's review. So just in summary, um, we're looking to set more ambitious goals um, and then the universal recycling, probably at a minimum will require recycling for commercial multifamily and residential, but has the opportunity to explore um, more uh, additional sectors like construction demolition are composting in the future. We are reaching out to other communities like Boulder and Fort Collins to see how their ordinances are drafted. And uh, that's, that's essentially the overview of my quick summary. I'm happy, either myself or Lisa are happy to answer questions, but we really wanted to, um, we're really trying to reach out early to our community and, and boards and commissions to develop a resolution and ordinance that really fits Longmont. Um, so we really wanted to understand with these increased targets, what are specific considerations we should be thinking through for parks and recreation? And I can keep this uh, question up or I could pull my, my, slide, my slides down, whichever is preferred. I think you could probably take the slides down so we can all. There you go. Great. Are there any comments? Yeah, I'm not sure if you can. So I'd like to start with a question that uh, about do we know about the impact of residential versus commercial sectors, um, which which has the a larger amount of waste generated, commercial or or residential, um, as far as uh, trash and recycling, and then also as far as natural waste such as compost. I'm going. Why? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to uh, pull up our. Um, our life cycle analysis as that looks at all of that. Um, the data that I, I most recently have is from 2019. And at that time, um, 
I think there's a, a Boulder County requirement for all haulers to report that data, their data that was that's being reported. Um, but from when I, the data that I have, which is from 2019, I think it was the second year they were recording data. So I know they did not fully have all uh, commercial data. data. Uh, I don't know if Lisa, you have access to the most recent uh, data. So let me pull that up very quickly so I can answer that question. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, but I think besides restaurants, uh, most of other commercial entities are not generating a large amount of food waste. I would, or, or any food service business, so grocery stores as well. Um, in terms of tonnage, let me just. So I'll just say um, when, as others are, um, if other council members have questions, well, Francie is looking for that. If you can use the raise hand function, that'll help me be able to call folks in order. Yeah, and and I just I just found that number. So from our other commercial haulers, the amount of waste landfilled was tw about twice as much as much as the amount of waste landfilled um, in in 2019. And it was not quite twice the total if you're looking at composting and recycling in landfill. So we do have a significant portion that's non-residential um, that is being pulled by a, a other commercial haulers at this time. And then looking, but I, I was correct that um, about tw twice as much is composted uh, by residents than by the commercial sector. So the, I think in terms of opportunities, there's a lot of opportunity for composting in the residential site and a lot of opportunity for recycling in, in the commercial sector. So Paige, I'll have to apologize, but I don't have the raised hand function. This is Aaron. I don't have the raised hand function. I don't have the uh, ability to do like a dot. Sorry, it's just not my. Okay, no, that's no problem. I thought it was just kind of standard on the display down at the bottom. That's okay. You can raise your actual hand. <laughs> that works too. Are there other questions from board members? Yeah, Nicholas. Thanks, Paige. My question is, uh, how, what have our what have our peer cities uh, done, or how have they handled this type of endeavor in the past? Right? How do we compare, and what are maybe that's a way for us to get some wisdom out of this about what the pitfalls are? Have we done any analysis about other cities and that have done similar things? Yes, we have, and I I um, will probably answer one of the questions I might pass it over to Lisa. So we've spoken with both City of Boulder and City of Fort Collins. Um, Boulder's program has been in effect for I think a couple years now. They did have a, a long education period. They worked a lot with uh, uh, Boulder County Pace to focus on the education and their ordinance focuses on uh, recycling and requiring recycling for both uh, commercial and multifamily. I believe they also are, and Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they also look at composting for restaurants specifically. And so, the, and they, they really put, they, their focus a lot has been on um, making sure that all the businesses and multifamily have recycling available. I think where they're starting, they haven't fully figured it out is that then making sure that people are using the bins properly. But I, they spoke a lot about, you have kind of like stages and they're still kind of in the getting it access that people can recycle before they can really continue to launch education. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Lisa to talk a little bit more about Fort Collins's program. Yeah, sure. So the Fort Collins program, they, they have a little bit different of a take. It's, it's focused right now just on recycling. 
they did a really extensive community engagement process of about two years. And then right as they were getting ready to roll it out, COVID hit. So they actually just rolled it out mid last year. So they're still pretty new in their process, but they um, have been extremely helpful in sharing with us a lot of the analysis and lessons learned that they did. They've um, both Boulder and Fort Collins as well as some folks from Boulder County have you know, helped give us some tips on you know, what time frame do we look at in terms of rollout? Because if you give people too much time that, that people just drag their feet and then you can lose some of the folks that you did the engagement with in the first place. So usually about six to 12 months is a good rollout period. Um, we've gotten some tips from both of them around possible exemptions. So Fort Collins has a really straightforward exemption process. They have a, a minimum threshold um, that, that folks need in terms of um, determining uh, which businesses or which entities have to comply. And then their focus in terms of enforcement is actually on the hauler rather than Boulder's focus is on the property manager and, or property owner. And those are two very different approaches. And so part of what we're doing in our stakeholder process is, you know, we're talking to a lot of, you know, external folks like this, but also talking to a lot of our internal staff that are, you know, impacted by or who are going to be really key in rolling this out to understand you know, what's the approach that Longmont should take for us to be most successful. Um, so we are talking to those folks. We're also trying to learn from other communities that have done it as well. There's obviously folks in other states, particularly on the West Coast that have other ordinances, but we're really trying to learn from our regional communities. Thanks, Lisa. Councilman Water. Uh, thanks, Paige. Lisa or Francie, it might be, I, it may be that everybody on this panel understands um, what we have the capacity to haul, right? In terms of composting and, and recycling and um, to grow uh, that capacity, what, what that will require. Um, Cause Lisa, you've made reference to haulers and uh, I, I didn't know until we got a presentation. I was on the council and we were getting a presentation uh, what the legal constraints were uh, what we can and can't do with with restaurants, uh, multiple uh, multi housing units, schools, etc. So help this group understand what our focus is right now, uh, what the constraints are, and, and then they probably ought to have some idea of what the implications are, because that's what we'll come to grips with, have to deal with at the time, what there are costs associated with doing, you know, of any of the things we'd like to do and how those costs are likely to get covered. And this group ought to think about that in relationship to the other things you're gonna talk about as priorities. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Waters. I'll, I'll jump on, in on that. Um, so just to take a little bit of a step back for folks to understand. So Longmont does have, we have our own municipal sanitation service, but we only serve um, single family households. We serve trash recycling and composting, and we serve um, some multifamily units up to eight units. Folks can, multifamily up to eight units can opt into um, the city's municipal service. And it, you know, and it, Charlie would be the best to give you kind of the, the much more finer grain details. But from my understanding, we're pretty at capacity from a municipal service standpoint. So if we were to expand additional service, be that to additional co customers. We serve all residential customers currently for trash and recycling and 24%, as Francie mentioned earlier, with regards to composting. If we were to have a big influx in terms of our composting um, subscriptions, we would probably need to adjust that, but we would probably likely be able to pay for that through service costs, although that's, that's definitely for a, a question for you know, our director of operations. Um, with regards to the commercial sector, multifamily above those eight units, those are all serviced by private haulers. So they pay, we have, I don't know, probably a dozen or so private haulers um, that provide trash. We already have a haulers license that requires all haulers to provide recycling service if people want to pay for it. Um, but that's all done through a private service. So the constraints to your question would would largely be if we wanted to look at somehow expanding who we served through our municipal service. Um, there wouldn't necessarily be constraints on the, if we continue to require that commercial 
entities go through a private hauler because that would be on the private haulers to to manage. Um, there are some constraints regionally in terms of facilities. So right now, the only composting facility is um, pretty far away, and so that that pretty dramatically impacts our our tipping fees. So right now, composting tends to be pretty expensive. There are some regional conversations about looking to collaborate on uh, a closer located facility, but there, you know, those are in only in conversation right now. As far as costs go, part of this process, as we look at evaluating those more aggressive goals that Francie mentioned, we'll be working with um, some consultants to do the data analysis around what are the programs and policies we would need to put in place to get to either of those different options and what would the costs associated be with those. So we don't have that information yet, but that'll be part of this process because it is likely that there's going to be some additional cost somewhere. Um, part of why we're trying to go through this stakeholder engagement process is to understand if, if a universal recycling ordinance requires recycling of, of everyone, of, of residential and multifamily and commercial entities, that's an added cost for folks. And you know, what can people bear given all of the other costs that people are dealing with right now? And what are some potential ways that we might be able to mitigate that through other measures? So can we help folks you know, reduce the cost that they're currently paying for trash service to help offset the costs for recycling, those sorts of things. That's what we're trying to figure out during the stakeholder process um, to really understand what both those opportunities and those um, constraints are and where, you know, where people can absorb that. And then, you know, if there is additional cost to the city, we would need to determine that'd be a conversation with city council what where we would want to look to get that revenue from. Um, so does that answer your question, Councilmember Waters? Does that help folks? Yeah, the uh, there's just a lot of moving parts and it's yeah. easy for a group that doesn't know all that to say, yeah, let's do X, Y, or Z yeah. without yeah. understanding how that might collide with other priorities, especially when we talk about increasing fees yeah. or rates when we're also raising other, you know, electric water and because, you know, we hear from the public every time we do that. And I'm guessing we will when we get into this conversation. And it's it, it's one of the most important conversations we're going to have in the next year without a question. Yeah. But there's just a lot, just the regional solution we're going to need to uh, to find on composting, right? Just yep. mm -hmm. by itself is just going to be a big challenge. I just, people have all that information as they're thinking about you know, if they're going to make an endorsement and, and what the implications are. That's all. Nice job. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a quick question and then we'll go to you, Erin. Um, I just wanted to hear briefly from David and Jeff about what would be different for them. I mean, Jeff, in terms of what impact this might have on recreation facilities, there were different requirements for recycling and composting and then for management of sort of parks and open space. I mean, I'm assuming you already take most of the materials that might come from like tree trimming and mowing the grass and, you know, all that kinds of things. Like what, what do you see as the potential changes this would bring in your areas? I don't see Jeff on yet. Jeff, are you on? Go ahead. Okay, He's on. I'll, I'll start. This is something that, um, you know, the city and, and Timber and Charles have been working on before I got to the city even. It's really how do we expand that right now? Our trash program is that kind of balancing um, between the cost of getting people out to every location in the park that you know potentially could use a facility and trying to educate people to use those facilities. You're trying to associate closer to trailheads and to shelters and places where we know people are generating trash. Um, and in those locations, um, a lot of that on the weekends is a challenge right now to get the seasonal help to. to pick that up. So we're, we are definitely ch facing challenges trying to bring people in to do weekend trash. Um, I'm sure as most remember at Lake McIntosh, um, we just had overflowing just trash cans, let alone the recycling out there as, as the amount of use increase out there. So it would take additional resources as far as helping to educate the public on which cans to use. We do have recycling in our parks right now, but it's not at every facility that has a, a trash can. So it would take some additional trash cans some better education and some additional staff. The piece we're trying to do to help with that though is that um, Timber is working on right now, there is a system called Big Bellies 
and they are a trash system that's basically um, solar powered and it's a trash compactor so that we can actually get more material into one into one container so we're not having to run out as often with staff so maybe we'd be able to reduce staff a little bit um, to do that but timber is working on that right now with the big belly trash systems um, but again we are just really struggling to get that kind of weekend help to keep up on top of it people try to do the best and they start seeing things alongside the trash containers in the parks um, right now we're just looking at potentially taking those temporary dollars and moving them to overtime for staff so it definitely is going to take some additional work to get the, the right containers and education. But right now we have staff out there dealing with trash is already out there. So I think incorporating this in is just gonna be something that I think we are already wanting and willing to take on. And I guess to add on to that, uh, the containers for our facilities, you know, we have recycling and trash right now. I don't see that being an, uh, a big impact. I would, guess that our bigger impact would be uh, at our events. And Rhythm on the River, Charlie has helped us um, really make that a environmental uh, event. And there, there were years that we were at 90% of the, um, what I will call, things put in the trash barrels were recyclable and you know, so that's been kind of an ongoing thing for rhythm, but we need to do probably a better job on Longmont Lights and our triathlon and, and turkey trot. And, and he has helped us a little bit, but the education is really the, the biggest piece, I think, for us. Great, thanks. Aaron? I, I'm sorry, was, oh, go ahead. Yep. The education piece, I think that's a, like Jeff said, that's a big piece of that, I think. Francie and Lisa recognize that as well, but also there's the design pieces too, that if we try to make sure we're getting recycling containers that don't take a pizza box really easy, or we, we at least can pull in the glass and the and the aluminum cans and not have it so contaminated. That's another piece of the parks that really happens is people start getting a lot of trash and sending besides the trash containers, they're just throwing stuff into the, the most available containers. So we do get a lot of cross-contamination of the parks, but design's a piece of that as well as education. Thanks, that's helpful. Erin, did you still have a question? Yeah, my question is for, probably for Lisa, but maybe for Francie. Um, can you tell me, you probably just can tell me really quickly, does our landfill um, that the city uses have methane capture technology and do they use it? That's a great question. And from not that I'm aware of, um, Francie, I don't know if that's something that you're aware of. I do not believe the landfill has a methane capture technology. Our landfills are newer. Um, so I, 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 I know compared to older landfills, um, they do emit less and even um, even if something is accident like a you put your yard waste um, into the landfill instead of composting, it actually is a, um, I always switch anaerobic and aerobic. I think it, it's anaerobic, so it actually, um, the carbon is still actually being stored in the landfill, so it actually is still a net positive. Um, it's even better to compost the, the woody material, but even if it ends up in our landfill, um, we are still having a, um, a net positive on our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we, when we did our life cycle analysis, we act because of things like that. And for, for those who aren't aware, a life cycle analysis looks at not just the trash going to the landfill, but thinking about um, the materials and how they were uh, produced, the transportation of the product, and then where the product goes. So even with all of that, I believe um, our trash um, still had a, um, a, 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 it avoided uh, more, uh, more emissions than generated emissions. Um, though that being said, we could avoid even more emissions with increased recycling and increased uh, composting and probably also a methane capture system.
So I see that you guys are potentially coming back around May with a draft ordinance. So you'll take all this feedback that you're getting from us and others and draft the ordinance, and then we'll get a chance to take a look. Yes, and I actually uh, had two more slides and the that I can pull up. So this is our timing. Uh, well, as you mentioned, we'll be returning in May with the draft and then uh, we'll working on developing the universal recycling ordinance. And if requested, we could also bring that to this board as well. Um, uh, and May will be specifically focused on the resolution. And then other ways to stay involved, we have an engaged Longmont page uh, where we have some a quick poll as well as a place for people to ask questions and submit ideas. And then uh, this is my my phone number. Um, this is also the general sustainability inbox. Uh, but you're also welcome to uh, both Lisa and Charlie are also happy to answer questions. And we can oh I can always forward you to the whoever uh, makes the most sense to answer the questions. Great, thanks so much, and thanks for working on that. So, when is the appropriate time to do input on the ordinance? So we've asked questions. So we have not yet drafted an ordinance. Are you um, interested in giving a more detailed feedback? And uh, so, Maybe it might be best for maybe let's connect um, af after this and any other board member and we can either set up a time to meet or see if um, it would make sense for for us to meet in kind of in a different focus group we're working on. Um, but yes, what we'd be happy um, to, to talk with you more if you had a lot of more detailed um, thoughts and opportunities and ideas for the ordinance. Member Waters. Yeah, in addition to at this in this phase during the public engagement phase and and the input that through sessions like this and whatever follow up you might want to do with Francie and and Lisa uh, in that July time July to December time frame, assuming we will have passed a resolution and at some point in that next six months we'll receive a draft ordinance. Um, there are going to there'll be at least two opportunities. One. Uh, on July 25th, I think, <coughs> excuse me, there'll be a, uh, a public forum. Um, so anybody on any topic can come and, and bring input on whatever they'd like to hear the council, have the council hear. And if this is a priority, that would be a good opportunity. In addition to public invited to be heard in public hearing when we're actually dealing with an ordinance. So I'm not certain when that's going to uh, happen. Uh, and I'm certain that Francie and, and uh, Lisa will get lots of guidance on, on the timing and all that. But those would be two opportunities. During the public forum, when we have an ordinance to consider, there'll be, we'll discuss that in public. We'll take public testimony before we adopt an ordinance, um, which is part of our protocol. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Francie and Lisa. Great to have you. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Okay, our next agenda item is to hear from Dan Wolford about the um, purchase near McCall Lake. Board members and council member Waters, thank you for this opportunity to bring you a, another land acquisition through the open space uh, program. Um, as we try to leverage our open space dollars, we've got partners on this uh, land acquisition um, with water resources, teaming up with our open space program to um, jointly purchase this uh, roughly three acres with Boulder County. Um, the total acquisition dollar amount is $430,000. Boulder County is gonna provide uh, the 215 and water resources and open space is gonna split that difference. Um, this is three acres that's immediately to the west of the uh, McCall uh, Lake na Nature area. 
Um, I've provided you a vicinity map to show you that particular location. Um, for this cost, we do get a foundation. Um, the current owner has gone through Boulder County's land use process to develop the property. Um, and uh, he's given no real specific reasonings why he's not continuing this, but he's gone through that uh, situation. So we've got a built foundation. We have a septic system that's been installed and ready for attachment. The other thing that we have on, on, on this parcel also is a Long's Peak water tap. And just you know, for your information, uh, the value of that Long's Peak water tap today is about $115,000. Um, again, it falls into the open space criteria is providing um, a visual corridor access to uh, lakes and trails and uh, passive recreation opportunities. Um, it also implements uh, and assists us in implementing some of the open space and greenway policies and strategies. Um, Boulder County has uh, taken this acquisition through their, um, their uh, open space advisory board as well as the county commissioners. And um, both of those have approved this uh, acquisition uh, unanimously. The interesting aspect of this is we will, uh, based on your recommendation, take this acquisition to council on the 29th, kind of what we would call a parent-child um, situation where the first thing we will do is take the land acquisition itself to the uh, council for approval, follow up with an IGA and uh, granting Boulder County a conservation easement for their participation. So it's basically a two-step process through council. So with that said, um, I will leave it up to you for any additional questions. Happy to answer any of those. I will tell you that um, we did reach out to Colorado Division of Parks and Wildlife for a fishing for fun grant uh, for this acquisition. Their response was, why don't you guys go ahead and you know, buy this three acre parcel and then come back to us. We would be happy to fund a perimeter trail around the reservoir similar to that that we've done at Lake McIntosh. So that would be our next hope, um, knowing that we are, well, as you all know, very tied up in a wide variety of capital de development projects for parks. Um, it would be yet another opportunity to provide passive recreation with shelters and restrooms on that lot. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about this acquisition. Okay. Councilman Waters, did you have a question or is your hand up from before? Anyone have a question? If not, I think we could entertain a motion to recommend this acquisition to council. Yeah, Nicholas? I motion to recommend this acquisition to city council. Great, we have a second. Thanks, Dan. I second. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Nope. Great. I think we're all supported, Dan. Is there Thank anything you else you need? <laughs> I am good. Thank you very much for your support. Awesome. Okay. And our next item is uh, to talk about the April meeting in person or virtual. Jeff, do you, are you going to adjust yep. that? Yep, I can. So uh, we have been okay to come back in person if that's what the board wants to do. Um, at this point in time, we, we don't have a, the ability to do a hybrid, but it's my understanding that the clerk's office will be taking that to council to get direction from, from them. And that may be available to us in the future, but as of right now, we have to pick one or the other. Just wondered what your thoughts were for the April meeting. So, and just as a reminder, we have before COVID typically met 
at the um, office on Sunset, and Jeff and David and I at least talked about potentially, we met in a um, conference room, but those of you that have been there probably know there's also a bigger, you know, kind of open space where they have public meetings, where if folks were more comfortable, we could set up, you know, more sort of spaced apart setting if that made any difference to people one way or the other. So any discussion? Yes? I would feel much more comfortable if we were in a well-ventilated larger space as opposed to a smaller conference room. Great, thanks. Erin? I'd like to meet outside and not because of COVID, but because it's more in line with our mission and keeping things, th thinking about the park. So meeting outside when the weather is appropriate, I think would be great. And in our parks and recreation facilities so that we're seeing. Have you guys ever considered meeting outside? Jeff and David, I'm not sure how we would do the public. Yeah, no, we Maybe haven't. We the, in the, you know, the only time we really meet outside is when we do our tours and those are, you know, posted and, and made so that the public can, you know, show up and attend those as well because it is still a public meeting. I think that'd be the, probably the biggest challenge. You know, sometimes we've even looked at trying to do a different facility, just give people a different venue. And it gets kind of confusing to the public on knowing where we're at and where we're going to be. So, um, I, I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying that um, I, I think it could be challenging for us to make sure that we're posting and noticing the public on where this group is going to be and then doing our, making sure that our recording system is there too, Jeff. Is that typically your staff doing that? No, that's actually Longmont uh, Media that does that. So it would have to be recorded. That would be part of our requirement. Well, we can definitely take it into consideration. Maybe there's some way we can incorporate that in the future. Dan? I was gonna say, we do have an outdoor meeting area available here at, at the parks. Again, weather has to be relatively decent, but we do have an outdoor canopy and tables. Uh, we have the ability to uh, bring a large monitor TV out outdoors and, and set that up, but again, um, I certainly wouldn't recommend it for a early spring meeting uh, like April, but certainly uh, uh, June, July, August, easily, you know, we, we can accommodate that out, out of doors um, with monitors and, you know, the recording and all those details. Thanks, Dan. Manoj, did you have a comment? And then Jeff? Yeah, I'm okay with the in room like we were doing before. Um, that is uh, ideal to have a, this kind of meeting. Jeff, did you have another comment? I'm not 100% sure how I feel, but I guess one thought I had was why don't we wait till see what the city council does in terms of hybrid so that whatever we pick, if someone needs flexibility for travel or safety or otherwise, we know if that's even a choice. I mean, I'm open. I'm open to to coming back in April. Also, I guess I just wanted to throw it out there. It'd be nice to know that if for some reason one of us was traveling or there's an outbreak, that we could some meet people meet and some people couldn't meet. But I am willing to come back also. Nicholas, any thoughts? Uh, I'll just say exactly what Jeff just said. Um, I'm kind of on the same page there. Right, I'm open to coming back, um, but would like to have the flexibility and know that we can, this is a dynamic thing, right? And that if uh, things shift again in June, we're ready to go back to remote if we need, so. And Dan Olson, I don't think I've heard from you yet. I prefer a in-person meeting. I don't care which of the two rooms uh, they were discussed at the South Sunset facility, but I'm okay with either of those. And even though I'm far away right now and I may not be able to hang on this meeting too long, I would prefer it in person, even if that means no hybrid. 
I think the meeting goes smoother and quicker and gets more productive if we're all together. Great. Can we just, do we have an option of just making a decision to meet in person in April and then we can revisit it at that time and see if we learn anything more about hybrid for the future? Does that work or no? I'm waiting. I think you addressed Jeff. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> I didn't know if that was for the board or yeah, I oh, no, can... for you, Jeff, I just wondered if we can decide today to meet in person in April and then just wait, kind of wait and see what we find out to make a decision about all of future meetings. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, I would propose then that we meet in April and we can try meeting in the bigger space just to see how it goes for that. Um, I'm saying that looking at you guys. I'm yeah, we can make we can make sure that's okay. Safe. So yeah, yep. we we definitely can work to make that happen. Okay. Okay. Can we have the lights do on, need... David, or do we have to meet in the dark like you? <laughs> you know, it's weird. I if I turn my light on, I get a halo over my head, which is just a weird <laughs> feeling that it's here. <laughs> okay. Um, is that something we need to vote on, or can we just agree? <laughs> I, I think we can just agree. I don't think we need a motion. Okay, great. Well, let's plan to meet April. Our April meeting will be in person at the Sunset office. I mean, you know, the world is what it is. So barring unforeseen circumstances, that will be our plan. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, I think that's the end of our new business items. So we can go now to old business. So, and the first one is just an update on our discussion about future recreation facilities. And last time we had passed a recommend recommendation for the council. So I don't know, Jeff or David, which one of you wants to address I, that? I can, I can, speak, I can yeah. talk about that. Um, okay. I, I did find out how to that we do that and that will be presented um, in the council's packet at their next meeting, which is, I believe, a week from tomorrow. We're not meeting until the 29th. It'll be on the 29th. <laughs> and then the other thing is we were you gonna say something, Dan? So say again what you're presenting to council. The motion that you all made at the February meeting about uh, uh, rec center being uh, a priority and encourage council to, okay. to work on that. So do we expect feedback or can we continue no, on or? No, we, will, we will continue on. Our next step is to um, get the money for the, the study um, appropriated, which that should be at the, the first opportunity that we have to do an appropriation, which I believe is at, will be at the April 12th meeting. And uh, we, we have a funding source from the recreation impact fee that is much like the park impact fee. And uh, that there's about two and a half million dollars in that right now. And uh, we've received general uh, approval to use that. We just need to get council to approve uh, that funding. And the, our and biggest then, challenge so far is getting, trying to come up with what the price tag is for that. We've reached out to our consultant that we worked with on the, the pool and ice facility, and we haven't uh, heard a response back for them. So we're going to reach out to Barker Ranker, who did the design of the Longmont Recreation Center to see if they can Great. at least give us a ballpark of uh, what we'll need to, to do that study. And is this just when you say study, is that a feasibility study or is this like a public, the public outreach to kind of get the new sense of what the public has an appetite for or what 
which study are you referring to? It would be a feasibility study, which would include public process, both with the general public and with uh, stakeholders. So we're redoing the whole start from the beginning kind of thing then. Yeah, I believe we will need to do that. Okay, gotcha. Wow, okay, and thanks. If it, when do you, how soon do you think that could start? And would you seek initial feedback into sort of what is looked at in the feasibility study? There'd be sort of some early stage input Absolutely. We'll, we will have to go to an RFP to hire a consultant and we can present that uh, report and the scope of services to the board to get feedback. I believe that a couple of the board members could actually be on the review panel. I don't know that, that you all would have voting rights, but you could certainly give uh, input to the staff as we're looking to uh, choose that company to do that work. If that's something you're interested in. Great. And when would that start if it's approved? If that the, whole process? It, it would probably start sometime in late May once we get through the appropriations and uh, and then get start getting work on on the RFP uh, purchasing right now is telling us that uh, their work is like three weeks out from once you decide uh, what what you want to do. Great. Councilman Waters, what do you suspect the council might do when they get our? Well, I don't, you know, we get, we get, um, uh, recommendations for additional appropriations periodically. You know, m maybe somebody has a question about them. I, I've asked questions from time to time, but generally it's a no brainer, right? It's carryover money. It's it's funded because of a fund like uh, the water fund or the park fund, et cetera. So the money's there. It's not a matter of trying to cut something else out in order to do this. Um, so I, that, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I just, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm wondering, uh, Jeff and David, have you had any uh, opportunity to have input? I know Rigo's working on a customer satisfaction survey. Right. And I know he's asked, we, he's asked us if, if we have input. And I had drafted some notes. I have not followed up with Rigo because I hadn't talked to either of you fellows about uh, a question or questions that we, if there would be a, a section that kind of looking to the future, not just to the past in terms of services, of uh, what the community might want to see and what they would be willing to support yeah. uh, in terms of parks and recreation, in terms of open space, in terms of performing arts and conference centers, in terms of library, et cetera, right? Just to get a feel of kind of where, where those might sit as, as priorities for the community. We've made that suggestion. We haven't heard the last, the last I heard back was the survey was too long already, so it might be really good if if you could make that suggestion. I will make it tomorrow morning. <laughs> I would say the same thing. We have actually um, reached out to Rigo. We sent some some questions in that we thought would help. Um, we tried to umbrella umbrella them under some other topics because we were told the same thing that they were really looking to cut the number of questions as opposed to adding to the number of questions. Yeah. Well. Best we can do is is push, ask yep. and push. Yeah. So I'll follow up tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Other Nancy questions Lyon. about this? Thanks for the update, Jeff. So yep. it's good to have progress. <laughs> Any other questions on this topic? Great. Okay. So the next topic is a potential retreat. So we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting. And just as a refresher, the idea would be for us to potentially get together 
in a less formal setting than a meeting, kind of like a study session for council where we have maybe two or three topics that we just want to learn more about. And we have time to talk about that. It would still, I mean, my understanding is it would still be posted and still be a public meeting since the, we're still um, an official meeting, but we would not have to operate in as formal a manner. So if folks are still interested in that, it would be good to hear sort of yes or no, um, roughly on the time frame, and if there's any key topics you'd like to consider. I'm going. Well, it's not my retreat, but but I did make a note as I heard, and because I think this would be relevant potentially to a retreat. I heard the comment earlier about the report card, and I know that was that's been discussed. Um, and it's it would be a report card, I assume, Jeff and David, on kind of where we are relative what I heard relative to the master plan. So it would be really helpful in that report card, at least at least for me to know of the projects that are on which we've made no progress, what's the scale of those projects and what it would take to move them forward. Because I'm, I'm just speculating that if you're absolutely candid in your, in your response to that question, staffing would be a response in every case. So I do think, Paige, for whatever it's worth, I think it would be really useful as I think about where we're headed with priorities for Parks and Rec, and I think about the budgeting process and the kind of input I'd like to take to that. Um, it'd be useful to know kind of what, 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 what are your priorities with respect to the unaddressed opportunities or projects in the master plan, what it would take to, to move those, what those priorities might be from your perspective, and then what will be required in the 2023 budget to make that happen. Because without that, when we get into those discussions, there's not much, I don't have much to say, and I'd like to have something to say that, that is reflects what your priorities are and what the needs of Jeff and David are. Because I know last year we added 31 FTEs. I don't think we added any of them to parks, recreation, open space, and, um, and natural resources. So um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, David and Jeff. So really appreciate that. And I think this is a great opportunity. One of the things that um, I think we'll hear a little bit later as we get updates from staff, the chair did ask some questions of, of staff on uh, basically the same thing. I think we were prepared to give a little bit of high level of conversation to that. The piece that I would just like to share here is that as probably some of you know, Gail Rademacher, our deputy city manager today was had his farewell going away um, after work get together. So. We, we have some changes in the organization, so we definitely we have some new leadership we want to wrap into this conversation as well. Um, but I think you guys have set the stage for us to really talk about what we need if we want to try to have different objectives as far as timing and getting things pushed through. If, if it is we want to get X number of parts done, how do we reverse engineer that and what kind of staffing do we need to meet those, those agendas? And I think we're ready to talk about it a little bit. I also want to make sure that I am keeping whatever new leadership I have in place involved in that conversation as we go forward. So there's a little bit of timing piece for me on that. Um, because I do think everyone's gonna say, we always need more staff within the city. There's a lot of people here trying to do a lot of things and pushing through and having to readjust. And as we readjust over here, that means a project may not get done or gets pushed out a few more years. And I think the community is kind of waiting for those projects that have been seen to get done. And um, I think for us to be accountable, I think the questions you're asking um, are really appropriate. The other piece I would actually tell you, though, is that we did, and then um, in Paige's question as far as some of the safety issues, we did get two new FTA, FTE rangers to help with the patrol and maintenance of our parks, greenways, and open spaces. Before, we had our rangers that were up at Button Rock in a union, and knowing that we have 100 miles of trail and 42 parks, um, we just did not have the resources there. So fortunately, council um, did give us those two additional ranger positions. But as far as pushing projects through, there's no additional resources there. Stay corrected on that one. I just want to make sure that I, I yeah, I want to make sure <laughs> I, I wasn't, 
taking advantage of the fact we did get the benefit <laughs> of council approving some positions. Hey, I'm just telling you as your liaison, I, I personally, one council member who would appreciate knowing what the priorities are from this board, uh, especially as they relate to things that are in the master plan, right? And, and what your thoughts are on what will be required in 2023 to, to move those priorities. So I, I think that's what you advise us on. And I'd like to hear that. And if a retreat is what you need to do to get there, that's, that's up to you. But I'm just telling you, that'd be real helpful. Thanks. Jeff? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, Tim, you were correct about recreation. We did not. We haven't gotten uh, new stuff in there you go. quite a few years. <laughs> and, and are in our second year of having a $1.1 million budget cut on, on top of that because of COVID and you know, things are looking better. And I'm, I'm hoping that we get at least part of that back in 23. I wanna tie into something that David talked about. Not only is this week's Dale Rademacher's last day, but Karen Roney, who is the department, uh, the director of the Department of Community Services is also retiring this month at, on the 31st, which will probably result in some di different leadership for us as well. And uh, so we're, we're living in a world of kind of unknowns right now, um, but we, I will have some things to respond to Paige's questions uh, later on as well. Thanks both of you. Are there other any other topics folks would be interested in learning more about? Um, yeah, we've we've talked quite a bit about the um, project development process, capital and group improvement projects. You know, budgeting, just sort of learning and understanding better how that works. Um, the timing that would be another thing that we could dig into. We could also talk more about sort of the out year planning in terms of open space acquisitions and connectivity. We've talked a lot about, you know, kind of trail connectivity in the past and just having some time to, those of you who haven't met in the, in our regular meeting room, haven't zoomed around with Steve on the, on the board where he kind of like takes the Google map and zooms around and shows us all the trails and future trails, but that can be pretty interesting and helpful too. Um, and if it doesn't feel timely to do a, a retreat yet, that's fine too, but I thought it might be good to get something on the calendar if we want to. It's kind of silent, but I, I just like to say that I think staff is more than willing and I think we'd really appreciate the opportunity to have those conversations with this board. I, I really appreciate the interest that they're having, the questions are being asked. And I think to have that opportunity, I think would be something that staff would be really appreciate the opportunity. Nicholas, did you have a comment? I, I wanted to break the silence a little bit because it seemed like there was, it was crickets a little bit, but um, I'm generally supportive of the idea. Uh, I certainly like the idea uh, of doing something like this. Um, I feel like I'm struggling a little bit with like what the content should be though, and like what I would recommend where to go on this. Um, where my mind goes is, so we're thinking about what topic do we want to focus on? Maybe it should be more like what um, what people we want to focus on, like what resources you want to focus on. Maybe it's something like like a day in the life of this department. I don't know. Maybe that's another way to to, to think about this. Um, just an idea for not there. And I'm happy to work with, I mean, if we can at least get some ideas, I'm happy to work with Jeff and David and maybe we can put something together and bring it back to all of you. So if there's any like any topics you're interested in, just let me know and we can put them on the list and think about it. Jeff? If it's gonna if it's gonna be tied to the budget, we'll need to have that conversation sooner than later because mm -hmm. we'll be into the budget in in May and that our opportunity to do any kind of requests will go away at the end of May. Yeah, 
Jeff Ellen Bogan, did you have something before I go to Dan? I just wanted to clarify what we're talking about in terms of timing and time commitment. When are we talking about doing this? Because that's always a variable. Or I, I guess we haven't talked about it, but that would impact. We haven't talked ability. about it. Yeah. That would impact my ability yeah. and interest to participate in such a thing. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, in terms of time frame, we could come, we could decide. I mean, I've been in retreats that are anywhere from like, you know, a couple hours kind of open discussion to a full day. And I'm guessing we wouldn't be able to take a full day. So probably, you know, probably around a couple hours. And then the time frame in terms of when, it depends. I mean, I think if we, if we wanted to talk about the sort of master planning, we could also do that in a meeting if we feel like that time sensitive and we want to put it on a future agenda in terms of the report card for the master plan. And um, I did pose some questions, some related questions to Jeff and David based on feedback I heard from previous board conversations. And so that will get us a little bit started today, actually, probably. Dan, any thoughts? Um, I similar to Jeff, I was curious, uh, timing wise, are we thinking about a second? I guess I have a funny echo. Are we talking about a, a second April meeting or a second March meeting, or is this the instead of the April second Monday meeting? I mean, I'm amenable to any of those, but as Councilman Waters or Jeff said sooner is better so we need to get cracking here i mean i guess i would propose you know two weeks from tonight or six weeks from tonight or four weeks from tonight whatever i mean i'm you know do we have enough i don't know what's on the thought agenda for next uh month from tonight you know second weekend in second monday in april is or you know one of the next three two-week intervals seems like it needs to happen or it's too late to worry about well, it would be if we want, if we're doing it to impact the budget. Right. It wouldn't be if we just have stuff we want to learn about. Oh, okay. Some Thank you. Time, sen time sensitive, some, and some is not. Um, Jeff, do you happen to have what we have on the agenda for next meeting handy? I'm looking right now. I know CIPs are on there. Uh, we also have uh, open space and greenway considerations, discuss the field trip. That, that's the three primary, and then, you know, the ongoing future recreation facility conversation. Okay. My thought well, would be that we do it on a second night and keep our normal board meeting. Yeah. I think that's what we would have to do. So I don't I don't necessarily want to take too much more time on this. You've given some ideas. Maybe Jeff and David, why don't we talk about maybe putting a little proposal together and bring it back? To the board so there's something a little more concrete that people can weigh in on all right that works that works yep great um and if anyone has any thoughts in the meantime please feel free to share them okay that is the end of our new and old business so we can discuss items from the packet update does anyone have any questions from the update that were provided in the packet. So the memo from David on parks and recreation, um, or parks and open space, and then the memo from Jeff on recreation. Looks like we lost Dan. He said he might have to leave early. He's with family tonight. Back oh, in. okay. Okay. 
Any questions from either of the memos? I have a question. This is Erin. So yeah, um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, number eight on uh, the uh, David Bell memo um, is uh, starts with prairie dog management, but it talks about um, assisting planning and development with site plan review with natural resources purposes such when Thomas gravel mining permit and Costco um, and the beaver management doesn't really give us any details like what are they thinking about site plan and I'd really like to know more about that. Um, you know, I thought Irwin Thomas gravel mining permit was out of it and that Costco got that parcel. I don't know. So I'm on, I'm trying to scroll through. Does it say up in there um, that Dan Wolford was the one that kind of put that update in there? It does. It it's does. It's in the ecosystem management. Yeah. I, I could do it, but I think Dan's on, yes. so he's, he could jump in. That would help, but I, I'm happy to, to cover it. Yeah, I'm happy to you know share with you. Irwin Thomas gravel mining operation is probably a six or seven year operation. They're starting on, on the south side of um, Ken Pratt Boulevard 119. Um, but as they move into, I believe it sells uh, five and six, those are on the north end uh, of Ken and Dan, Pratt Boulevard. Could you say when you when they we say when they move into the cells, you just kind of mention what that what it kind of looks like they divide the property up into mining areas which they call cells. And they will tackle those one at a time. They kind of broken it up, like Dan said, south and north. But we have several cells that we have gravel mining out of and then moving to the next one. Correct. And so they're starting at the Costco site and moving to the east. Once they're finished with that, which will likely be at least two to three years, then they will move to the north of, of Ken Pratt Boulevard, um, which is currently city open space. Um, they have a current recreation or recreation. Uh, I'm, I'm so focused on Jeff Friesner that I, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, they have a current reclamation plan that shows e existing uh, reclamation of open water and, and wetlands. Um, staff between myself and David and Ken Houston, we have a number of other recommendations that we, we would like to see. Um, we're not really convinced that we need any more open water that we have to augment with water rights. Um, we would really like to see the extension of the left-hand creek corridor go through there. So we will be negotiating with aggregate industries um, to make some modifications to the reclamation plan. So that's the intent. We're dealing with aggregate industries probably on, on at least three properties at this point in time um, and, and dealing with some of the gravel mining operations that are going to take place on Irwin Thomas South. Um, the tall property, you've probably heard us speak of, of that, as well as the Golden Farms parcel uh, on the north side of um, Ken Pratt Boulevard. We could certainly do, as we get closer to this and, and you know start to negotiate with Agrit, I, I, I'm certain David and I would be happy to uh, bring some of these concepts to you, but we really believe it would be very beneficial to the city to have the left-hand creek corridor go through the Golden Farms property and um, daylight uh, into the same frame further to the uh, east than it currently does. So on that, you said that they're going to be mining where on the same Costco parcel. Are they going to mine before Costco goes in? I don't understand that. That's there may they won't be mining the Costco parcel, but they're immediately to the east of Costco. They will be gravel mining. So basically, what has happened is, is through the city and uh, Diamond G, um, the city of Longmont has purchased that property from Diamond G, and in turn turned that land, conveyed that land um, over to Costco. The Diamond G property is what is currently being gravel mined by aggregate industries to the east of Costco. So they will march, I believe they have three or four cells 
that they will move to the east in a process which will take, again, I believe somewhere in the vicinity of two to three years before they jump to the north side of State Highway 119, Ken Pratt Boulevard onto city open space. No chance David, of getting that did you want to add something? <laughs> I'm sorry, what, Aaron, Aaron, what was your question? No chance of getting that jump north stopped. So on that, that jump north, I, th I think you mean the mining north of 119? Yes. So yeah. one of the things, well, when, the, when the city purchased that property, we, did not, we were not able to purchase the mining rights. So we knew if you look at Golden Ponds and Pella Ponds, a lot of times when we get those opportunities to purchase those properties, they maintain those mining rights. And then we work with the reclamation companies to get something back that, um, again, is not what it looks like today as a hay field. But hopefully through working with the reclamation companies, we can get something that is still a value to our community. And as Dan mentioned that we don't want any more open water. I, I think as he said, we don't like the augmentation piece. But if you think about when those ponds just sit there, that's just water that evaporates. And we have to maintain that within our systems. So we have to find additional water for that evaporation. Um, we have a lot more fishing opportunities and open water than Colorado ever had because of mining. So what Dan's talking about is really trying to do something that's much more of a riparian upland where left-hand creek would come through that old mine, what would be re reclaimed, allow left-hand creek to meander, to provide some more natural flood capacity and make something that um, just has a much more natural feel for the way that the St. Vrain Creek and left-hand creek have been channelized, but give that, that creek and that system a more room to move. So it's something that is not typical. I think when mining companies like to leave, they think everyone just wants a gravel pond left over so people can fish. Um, we would love to see much more diverse habitat than just open water. So I think Dan has some really good ideas on how we can try to make this um, something that probably is a better ecological piece than even the hayfield that sits there right now. Thank you. Any other questions on items from the memo? If not, we can go to items from staff. Yeah, Dan Wolford. Yeah, I just want to reach out and, and thank Jeff and Ben Wagner for their help and assistance with the Chick, Chick Clark Fishing Education Program this year. This is probably our 20th year of doing the Chick Clark Program. And um, with the assistance of the, re the recreation staff, we modified the program this year a little bit because of COVID. And <clears throat> what we did, we took 110, 100 to 110 rods and reels and made those available to the public to sign up for the youth of our community. Um, through Jeff's staff and the assistance of Ben, they were able to put that registration up and those rods and reels were signed off and, and taken within three hours of being up. So um, what we've done is uh, we stocked about 500 fish at Isaac Walton this past week. We will stock another thousand on Wednesday with the 19th being the first day of spring break with a number of press releases and that kind of thing. We will be putting that out to the community, just reminding the kids of the community that this is a outdoor recreation opportunity made available to them year round. But like we've all said, and, and numerous of, you know, that have been fishermen, there's nothing like fun and excitement of fishing than catching fish. So we will be stocking over uh, 2,500 fish in the next couple of weeks and providing this recreation opportunity to the community. So I, I just wanted to, again, thank Ben and, and Jeff and Sue Ellen for their help and assistance in this program. That's great. Sounds like a great outcome. Any other items from staff? Yes, David? Jeff, um, Paige, I don't know how you want to address the questions you have brought to staff. I don't know if that's something you, during your update, if you would like to read that into the record for them and I can, I, Jeff and I can respond to that or we'll, we'll handle that however you, you'd like us to. 
Yeah, I was just going to bring that up during items from board. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and share. So I had heard over various conversations a few different questions from board members related to capacity and project workload and you know what would it take to be able to address the backlog? We've had sort of these kind of lingering questions. And so I sent those and I can just, do you want me to just read it and then so that it can be captured in the notes? That would work for me. I, I could kind of fit my answers into the, but I think that helps us the background okay. a little bit. If you wouldn't mind doing that, I appreciate it. Yeah. So the questions I said is that um, members of PRAB have an interest in better understanding the capacity that would be required to one, more quickly address the backlog of approved capital improvement projects and to ensure that natural resource sustainability and public safety are effectively addressed at our existing recreation and open space locations. And then there was a related question that was, we'd also be uh, interested in understanding what unmet needs you see in your areas of responsibility based on feedback you received from the public and your staff. So, and obviously those are long questions, so wouldn't necessarily expect full details, but just kind of wanted to set the stage. And if you recall, there was also a potential item that we approved in the agenda to kind of in the, the calendar that we approved last time to talk about kind of staffing and capacity needs related to the areas of interest for the board. So, Jeff, so I will. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Jeff, do you mind if I start this and we nope, can go that, that way? works. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I would like to say that I, I do appreciate these questions coming to us. I think it's something that um, as we continue to come to Prab and bring CIP and it, you look at that list of projects and how we move through those or how we don't move through those sometimes, um, I'm going to start with something that probably everyone in this group has heard about for way too long now. Um, but if you've gone out behind Left Hand Brewery on the Greenway, the city is still involved in flood recovery. So if you talk about black swan events back to back, you know we really um, hate saying that, but we still have staff fully engaged in flood recovery projects that really take away from um, the master plan projects that were put out there in 2014. Um, then you put the COVID piece on it. And as Jeff said, you know we have budget dollars pulled away and asked to kind of hold back on um, doing things so we could take those dollars, and maybe reappropriate those those dollars to areas where the city wasn't quite sure what their budget was going to look like. And now, um, with supply chain issues, every project manager I have is looking at you know at least double on transportation costs and fees as supplies are coming in if they can actually get it. So I, I really feel like I'm giving some excuses here to start with, but the hard part is, as I start doing what I've been trying to do my plan to answer this question, is that how do you reverse engineer this? How long did it take to actually build the park? How long does it take to do the RFP process? How long does it work with the, the consultants? How long is the public process piece? And we've been really trying to work through that since you've given us these, these questions here. With that said, having Steve and Kathy, who you all know, and Danielle Levine, who has um, got about a third of her dollars coming from the general fund, um, right now, with funded projects, um, we feel that probably takes about a year and a half to two years to go from the project identified to doing the RFP, to putting the RFP on the street, to letting staff evaluate that project, that, that RFP project, bringing the design on, doing the design, bringing the public in to be part of that, that process, taking the final design to a consultant for the, the construction of that project, following through with construction. Um, that looks like it's about a year and a half to two is if we don't have any of these others, like I say, these very unique situations come up. So that being said, we right now in funded projects, we have 18 funded projects. Um, some of those are, as the council, council member Waters mentioned, some of those are smaller pedestrian bridges that have to go in, but um, of those, Three are significant greenway projects, 
phase 13 going from um, Golden Ponds out to Airport Road, going out to the state park. Six of those are new projects, things like Nino Gallo and, and um, Clover Meadow and um, Fox Meadow. So we have six of those projects and then nine of those smaller projects. So if you just look at those funded projects right now that are assigned to someone, there are 18 of those. And knowing that our average to get something done is about a year and a half on the good side with supply chain working. After that, we have another 11 projects that um, are funded that are on no one's work plan right now. We have 34 projects that are um, really within the city that impact the park. If that's a ice pavilion out there that really my staff is assigned to, maybe engineering's doing it, or is a sewer project going through a park, my staff becomes a subject matter expert as we look at how that's going to impact the park. And we have 34 of those out there. And then we looked at all this stuff, the Adam Dairy, which the city council has approved us to buy that, that property. And we know we're getting a master plan for that. We have Plum LLC that Dan talked about, um, the contribution that the state parks would give us for fishing as fun grant. We have 17 that are out there that we know we could probably go to and start doing other projects through GOCO and other stuff. So we have a long list of projects I think we'd love to be able to put out there, but to put that in a realty timeline is something that we just really haven't done yet. And what we'd like to do is bring this work product back as we do CIP next time or through your um, retreat process and really have us take a hard look at this and say, what can we do with the staff we have? And then what if we want to multiply that by a factor of X, would it take in staffing to do that? If that seems like, if, if that's what you're really looking for is how we try to balance product output and the amount of staff we'd need. Paige, you're, you're, you're muted. Sorry, I was double muted. And is that is that um, what you're hoping for is to kind of see that project yeah, list yeah, up? Yeah. I just kind of, I mean, this does no good right now. This would like, I mean, this is the kind of that, that list we give you. You could look at it, you would see what's on there. We'd say that this is going to take us X amount of time. And then if there's a distraction, or if we need to work on something else, it slows it down. And we know it takes X amount of staff time to do that. And then we could start again, reverse entering these, these priorities for PRAB and for staff and say, if we want to do it at a accelerated rate, here's the ways we think we could achieve that. Do you think that we could have that conversation at a meeting? Or do you think it would be hard? I mean, would it be better to be able to work through it with more open time? I, you know, if we um, look at agendas and look at it CIP, I think we can start that. I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I was trying to do a little of this math on how many of these things actually came up for Steve and Kathy and Dan and others, you know, really kind of gave me a bunch of kind of raw data here. Um, and I was looking at some of those numbers. So I, I missed as far as the retreat time, if we can time that, it might be a good time, but we can definitely at the CIP meeting, which is next month, I believe, would have Steve and Kathy and me there, would have this list. We really could give, I think, a good overview, which then if you want to really dive into it, maybe the time for the, the retreat to have that deeper conversation. But I think we do a good job um, really preparing this group to have that conversation at a meeting. Great. Jeff, did you want to add your thoughts and then we can just open it up if there's any other questions? Yep. Uh, you know, David talks about uh, the CIP projects and, you know, recreation rents out everything that his staff does. And we are in a, a, a time where we haven't added really any athletic fields to the city system in quite some time. And uh, we have user groups that are really interested in expanding our capacity to do more soccer and football and baseball and, and really uh, cricket would be in that same situation. So anything that could be done to get those uh, uh, parks expanded to include those would, would be great. Um, as far as specific to recreation and, and budget, one of our main priorities would be to get the 1.1 million uh, reinstated back into our budget in in 2023, and then 
probably even a more urgent issue uh, that we have right now is trying to address temp wages. You know, we did a, a study in the city and uh, not only comparing other municipal recreation, but also some of the private sector. And the average that people are paying is 1550 right now. And all of our lifeguards start out at $13 an hour. Um, I was in a meeting with the city manager today and I was explaining to him that recreation needs 74 more aquatic staff um, yet this year for us to open Sunset Pool as well as to be able to keep Centennial and the rec center open. And we, we really need to do something to reevaluate the temp wages and, and get some additional funding there. We're also considering um, doing a bonus program where um, if, if a staff person in aquatics will commit to working the entire summer that we would give them some type of bonus uh, if they make their commitment. For the future, we're looking at trying to take some of our temp wages and moving pool managers and some of our front desk staff from temp to uh, more of a, a regular or regulars what full-time people are called within the city to be able to have some consistency and some retention that we really uh, don't have right now. Um, and then the, the final thing is uh, trying to hire a therapeutic coordinator that could help us with all of our scope and, and uh, IDD uh, programs that we do. Um, we, we do quite a few things but feel like our community, there's a lot more demand out there. We feel like the programs with, that we do offer are, are done well and would like to see uh, the opportunity to expand those offerings. Great, that's helpful. David? Yeah, just real quick, as Jeff did mention the staffing piece, and it's one of the things I think um, Harold and Dale had made a commitment that it, at least that we're trying to do that. Council Member Waters may recognize this too. When we do a council approves a project like a new park in Eno Gallo, and it takes a year and a half, two years to get that done. And then there's a warranty period after that. So we would be coming back two and a half years later and say, we've added X number of acres, X number of resources, X number of mowing, X number of trails, and we need new staff now. That used to just go into the general fund request with every other request out there. Harold has made a commitment that we can try to remind council when this comes in that this will be a level one request that it really is the highest level request that if we made a commitment to build a park, put these assets in place, we need to have the staff um, and the budget to maintain that new asset. So that's a positive piece that we're moving, moving forward with the staffing on our end. Um, so I, I don't have Quite the same need Jeff does there, um, but for me it really is that staffing piece of the probably the project managers moving it forward. But staffing is definitely a challenge. I know that Jeff is really facing it. Um, continue to work with him out of union, especially on that. What would it take Jeff to have the 1.1 million reinstated? I believe that if we have a better year, which we already are having. Um, that I, I think is COVID hopefully disappears and stays away, um, that people start using our facilities and programs more. I think that would uh, help that to, to happen. So I do, I mean, if there are there any questions from council members about any of this? these initial numbers tonight. I do want to make sure that we can have this discussion when we have ideally like our whole our whole board. So when Dan and Scott are also present um, so we can follow up more either at the next 
meeting or at a an interim retreat. Paige, were you asking about to... you asking about council members or no? The... I was asking about the board. Okay. I just misspoke. I said council and I meant board. David, did you want to add something? Yeah, and I'm sorry, just just to to. Um, make sure because you mentioned Scott is not here tonight and Scott has sent some very similar questions about um, our plans and things that he's heard about over the years of being a Longmont resident and where those go. So I, I think these questions that you're asking are, um, are very appropriate and ones that I think, you know, um, for staff to be able to be held accountable and to make, answer these questions, I think we're, it's, it's time to do that. Councilman Waters, are there, since you're there, are there any other related questions you think we should address when we follow back up on this? No, I think you're spot on. I, you know, I, I've talked with, I mean, I've talked with Jeff and David about these issues and um, I just want to make certain, you know, just as I run kind of a parallel path to, to where you're headed, that, that when, by the time we get into budget discussions, I'm well informed uh, to support the kind of priorities that your recommendations and what I know their needs are. Um, so, and it's helpful to hear this conversation just in terms of, I think, as I think about my own preparation, so. Great. Okay, well, I think that's a good start. And I appreciate you guys bringing, preparing some information to share in response to those questions. And hopefully we can follow up on that conversation. Are there any other items from board members? Any other questions? Or Aaron sitting outside. I hope you're not freezing out there. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's nothing else, I think we are ready to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Manoj? I initiate the motion to adjourn the meeting today. Okay, great. A second? Yes. Great. All those in favor? Aye. Thanks, everyone. The meeting is adjourned, yeah. and we'll look forward to seeing you in person at the next one. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.